When I completed Project Junicron, that's my dual CPU rig in the background here, a lot of people were asking me how I tuned this thing, since there are a lot of tricky settings there in the server motherboard BIOS. So today I'm going to be showing you exactly that, and we're going to be going through what add-in cards I use and how I also quickly set things up in Windows. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. This is Brian coming to you guys today with a sort of tweak tuning guide for your dual Xeon E526 CPUs. Now the motherboard I am using is the ASRock EP2 C602 motherboard. So if your motherboard is different, then you may have some settings that appear different. Though for what it's worth, most of the settings will be very similar. They may just carry slightly different names. So once we're in the BIOS, we can move over to the Advanced tab here, and I like to go down to Wii Configuration and disable that, since I'm not using this as a dedicated uh, server. Uh, going down to CPU Configuration, I like to make sure and check that all these settings are the same as they are here. For instance, I've got hyper-threading enabled, all my CPU cores active, and then I like to disable virtualization technology since I am not using a virtual machine. Uh, Northbridge configuration, I like to go to input output hub configuration here, go into VTD and input output and disable these, and then going down to primary graphics adapter, you wanna make sure this is on PCI Express and your onboard VGA is disabled if you are using this for a workstation. Now, our Gen 2 speeds here are absolutely fine, even though you can set them to Gen 3. I've just found that with my GTX 970, it actually runs slightly better on Gen 2 speeds. I don't know exactly why that is, but again, that's just my trial and error kicking in. Uh, QPI speeds here, I like to leave ISOC on enabled and the QPI link speed on fast. And the other two, you can leave them on auto. It's not gonna affect anything in the real world. Memory configuration, a very important tab here. I like to put my memory mode on independent. You can set this to mirroring, though it's essentially what that does is make your memory RAID 1. So your memory is virtually never gonna crash if you have that thing on. Crazy uh, setting there. Uh, ECC support, I like to disable this since it allows me to overclock my memory better. Now, if you do need ECC, for instance, if you're doing financial work or whatnot, you may wish to have this enabled. It can save a crash in a very rare instance. Though for what it's worth, I like to disable it. Then moving down to the uh, power limit setting here, we can put that on one and then moving on to uh, just performance monitor and DFX devices, I like to hide that. And then again, uh, the uh, power limit mode there, I like to set that in one, which is just on default. And then NUMA unified uh, memory access, I like to, um, sorry, non-unified memory access, I like to disable that. And then uh, MPST support, disable that as well. Moving down to DRAM frequency, you have uh, limited options here, though the options available are still plenty enough for us to get a great overclock out of the memory on the server board. Since the default for this memory is 1333 megahertz, by uh, essentially putting that up to 1866 and then disabling the ECC support here, I'm able to get my memory like at pretty much a 50% overclock, which is huge for DDR3 memory, especially some of the Gen 1 stuff, which this was in that era uh, in 2012. Now the rank channel interleaving, we can put that on four way and rank interleaving in eight way, which enables this to be octa channel memory, which is great with those two dual Xeons there. So patrol scrub, demand scrub, and data scrambling, these are server features. You can just disable them unless of course you're using this for a server. Thermal throttling, we don't have to worry about that since we're not playing around with the voltage too much. Uh, now going down to the south bridge configuration, we can just put the settings on like that if you wish to copy me, since I only use one onboard uh, LAN port, I don't need the other one enabled. I like to disable deep sleep as well since I don't like my computer going to sleep on me. A USB configuration, have them both enabled. ME system, that's nothing really to worry about. Clock generator configuration, we can disable the spread uh, spectrum there, which unless you are living in a very sort of frequency interrupted area, you may wish to leave that enabled, that's up to you. Though it will affect performance or overclocking performance slightly. So hence I like to disable that storage configuration. Very important tab here. I like to put my SATA mode in RAID. So even if you are not RAID uh, zeroing or RAID wanting devices, you may wish to put this in RAID mode anyway. This enables you in the future to change or uh, change drives, add in RAID 1 and RAID 0 uh, drives if you wish to, and not have to worry about reinstalling Windows. However, since I am using two three terabyte drives in RAID 0, I do like to have that on. And I do like to turn off the Marvel RAID uh, SATA 3 controller there, 
which just increases boot times and I don't even use it anyway. SCU uh, devices like to disable that as well. And then moving down here to super input output configuration, I just disable both these PS2 ports. Uh, serial port console, console redirection, disable that since I'm not using these serial ports anyway. Uh, voltage control, another very important setting. I like to, uh, as we can see here, I've got my memory at 1.4 volt. Though honestly, for everyday overclocking, I like to set it at 1.45 volt. This is just an overclocking thing where you find a stable overclock and you just give it that next step above what you had it on stable. This just makes sure that your memory is never going to crash, even though unfortunately the increments are quite large on this motherboard. I would have had to, have, I would have liked to have had it at maybe 1.42 volt, though 1.4 volt really isn't a, uh, that much of a biggie because it is running at 1866 megahertz at 1.5 volt, uh, 1.45 volt, which is really good. Uh, PLL voltage, you can leave them on auto since they are at 1.8 volt. That's about right for this uh, CPU on this motherboard. And then VTT voltage, this is essentially the core voltage of the CPUs. I like to set them at 1.05 volt. And then uh, PCH voltage, I like to have that at 1.1 volt. Uh, so now, once we're done with the most important tab, the motherboard does have some other features like your fan speeds, which you can set them, uh, which I've done here, to level four, which essentially just makes them a lot quieter and they're still able to work perfectly fine. Now the CPU idle temperatures here, as you can see, they're 50 degrees. Uh, that is a little bit warm, but again, the multipliers, since you've got eight cores and the minimum that these run at is 1200 megahertz, they are gonna get quite hot on idle anyhow. So it's nothing to worry about. The max temperatures I've seen on even like on full load is about 60 something degrees. So they do run a little bit hot, nothing to worry about. And then system event log, I like to disable that since it's not a server. Boot options, another pretty important setting if you wanna speed up your boot times. I like to have the prompt timeout just to one and then also like to disable the full screen logo. After we've done that, we can save changes and exit and we are ready to go into Windows. So now once we're in Windows, we can stress test this system if you like to. And as I was talking about before, the idle temperatures really aren't a problem or they shouldn't be a problem. Um, so as again, I just booted up, so it's taking a little bit of time to load up everything. But uh, we can move straight in here to IDA64 and we can go to uh, just stress test it if you wish to. So you can stress test everything in IDA64 if you wish to. Stress system memory, stress case, stress FPU stress CPU. So we can do that for around whatever, 10 minutes if you like to, uh, an hour, two hours, three hours, it's up to you. And you'll notice here that the statistics, you can watch your CPU cores and see if they get hot or not. And I think that was a website, hotornot.com or something uh, ages ago. But uh, we got here, we can see here my temperatures are perfectly fine, even though I've only been running it for 30 seconds, but we can just watch that over say an hour and see if our temperatures get that hot. But the max I've recorded, I think was like 67 degrees, which is perfectly fine on the Sandy Bridge architecture. And one thing you have to keep in mind is that I have spray painted my Cooler Master C212 Evo coolers white, which is not exactly the best color to be spray painting heat sinks. It's actually the worst color to spray paint your heat sinks because it uh, traps the heat in from uh, what I know. So now there's just one more little thing I'll touch on and that is with the Zonar DG sound card, which is a sound card that I highly recommend for a workstation like mine. Since it is cheap, it does have a great onboard uh, mic in port there, which you're gonna absolutely love if you're using something like I'm using, like the V Motor Boom Pro. Now you go, if you wanna have this sound card working perfectly, you go get the latest drivers of the Zona DG from this website and then you install it and then after you've installed the sound card you then want to manually extract the driver from C drive here so C drive Windows and it should be in system 32 uh, and then you go to driver store file repository now you should if you've just installed it it'll be right up the top if you do date modified However, for me, since I have installed some other drivers since then, it's around about here, so Zonar DG. So you'll then want to control copy this, and then just for instance, just uh, paste it to wherever you want to paste it here. So we can just drop it in here. Uh, this is in my games and temp. And now if I uninstall the unified drivers, 
I can then go into Device Manager and manually um, install the driver where the Zonar DG sound card is. So you can see here, I've manually installed it. So I've got no software. I've only got the updated driver for Windows 10 here since the ASUS driver themselves from their website is like backdated to 2013 and it was causing my PC to crash. Now I'm not sure about the PCI Express model. I am using the PCI model and I'm having um, just absolutely no problems with this sound card in Windows 10 in both games and productivity. So I highly recommend it if you install it like I've installed it today. Anyway, that's about it for me today, guys. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to hit that like button. If you have any questions or comments about the dual CPU rig in the background here, then be sure to drop a comment in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Also, some other quick things that I'll touch on is the Windows power management. In Windows, I found it didn't really make a difference. I like to have mine on balanced and disable those deep sleep settings. That's what I've found works best for me. Your mileage may vary though I found it doesn't work it make a difference in the workspace. Also, another thing that I do in Windows 10 is I do apply my Windows 10 optimization guide. So if you haven't checked that out and you wish to make your windows a little bit snappier and get rid of some of those privacy invasive features, then be sure to check out my guide. I'll put the link up here for you and I'll catch you in the next tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.